you being a Southern girl, you might say? Yeah, I would say, I don't think I can count myself as Southern until I moved to Lexington. I feel like I was like mountain. I, I've heard this said in like Appalachia. It's totally, totally different. Um, but, you know, I think like in terms of climate activism, there's some like very clear connections I can go into about cyclical poverty in places like Appalachia um, and extractive industries and how that manifests in like my political ideology and work today. Um, but I mean, at the very least, like I eat a lot of cornbread and soup beans and I enjoy them very much. So do you say y'all? I do. Very do you, unironically. And do, have you ever heard people say, come on, all you all? No. <laughs> oh, all y'all? They're like, oh. come on, all y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All y'all is a very common phrase. <laughs> we, have our, we have our own dialect. I don't know if you've taken like the New York Times kind of like dialect um, quiz. It like maps what part of the country you're from and gives you three cities. Um, but anyone who I know from like Eastern Kentucky who's taken it, my mom's not from there, but my dad, like my dad grew up there. Um, and I mean, it tried it's like one of the few places that it can triangulate like perfectly because we have such random ways of speaking. What What are some other examples that are kind of Kentuckian rather than just Southern y'all? Ooh, that's a good question. A lot of it I feel like is phrases. So I say things like pouring the rain, which I like, I don't, I don't, I like it and I think it feels natural to me, but for a lot of people like the idea, like pouring the rain is just not like, grammatically correct in any way um I don't know off the top of my head it's like Does, buggy do you call like your shopping carts buggies oh no it's I think it's like very situational um but I also think like a lot of people were exposed to very specific kinds of literature and so the large vocabulary words that we use are all quite random but also all the exact same because we were all we all read the same books growing up and does pouring the rain mean like use it in a sentence like I would say like instead of saying like it's raining I would say or like it's like really thunderstorming up I say like it's pouring the rain oh no I haven't heard that one that's interesting oh my goodness um so are you in high school now where are you in school uh, yeah, so I am a junior this year, and I'm at Henry Clay High School, which is in Lexington. And um, do people come from all over? I mean, is it a, is it a fairly cosmopolitan city, or um, do you think of it as kind of a small town kind of school? Um, so I would describe Lexington itself as a suburb, really. Um, but I think that like the school system is one of the few things that feels like a city. I did education policy work before I did climate work. So I've done a lot kind of like with the schools and really critiquing them. Um, so I go to a magnet program, which I spent a lot of time really heavily critiquing and then decided that I was going to stay in it nonetheless um, within kind of this broader school. But I mean, I would not say it's cosmopolitan, but I would say it, for a place like Kentucky, it is decently diverse. And Magnet, is there a specialty <clears throat> in, in your school? Theoretically liberal arts. So um, it's kind of like based on advanced placement courses. Um, I did not I did not know when I moved from Eastern Kentucky what the implications of a Magnet program were. Neither did my mother. I mean, I went to private Catholic school with 60 kids, so... It was, it was definitely, yeah, it was, it was a complete and total shift, but well, we're here. What grade were you in when you moved? Yeah, so I was in sixth grade. Oh. So it was enough time for me to, like, live and consider myself as Appalachian, um, but my parents had always decided that it, like, when it came time for middle school, it was important for me to have an opportunity outside of Eastern Kentucky, really. Mm hmm So did they move for you? So my father still lives there. We have, um, my family was farmers in Salyersville, so we have a big beef, not big, but like a, a beef cattle farm um, that 
And then I grew up right down the road from there. So my father still lives in this house that he got from his uncle. And we've lived on for some time. And, like, we have this generational homestead just up the road. Um, but now my mother and I live in Lexington. Do you have siblings? I do not. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times achieving girls are firstborn. So oh. you fit the pattern. <laughs> Do do yeah. you do you feel like a Virgo? What is what does being a Virgo mean for you? I don't know. I really struggle with. I think that's so funny that you ask because actually my Instagram bio is like struggling to accept my Virgo status. Um, because I think in a lot of ways I am very Type A. I'm very committed. Um, but I I don't necessarily think I'm rigid in the ways that I think a lot of Virgos are portrayed. And I also am ridiculously extroverted so you know the things that I think are associated with Virgos I think are Hermione Granger which I'm not I'm not completely opposed to but I, <laughs> I also think it's like um I think it's odd to meet a Virgo who is also like a type 3 Enneagram there I I do a lot of personality test type things well that's Virgo um, I think yeah. and so I think that yeah and and you're you're type three on the enneagram. Yes. Um, I will I, say, climate movement activists are type threes that I've met. How interesting! Like who else? Um. So, a couple of people in Sunrise who I work with, we all took it together. Um. It was like a way of like understanding our team. Yeah. Us are. Um. It's so funny. I think the ones who. The ones who, like, lead actions and do action planning are usually type 3. And then, like, people who are doing, like, training or internal work are not so rigidly one Enneagram. But if you're, if you're doing actions, you're almost always. That is interesting. Well, um, I'm a one on the Enneagram. Oh, interesting. And I think, but I kind of, a lot of times I'll just score high in three, but I don't care about image, but I care about working and achievement and that kind of thing. Um, do you know the Myers-Briggs, the Kiersey and Bates? Yes, I know so, Myers-Briggs. So you're extroverted, intuitive, feeling, um, judging? I think I'm... I have not, I, that does sound very right. I have not taken it in quite some time. I actually think it might be E and thinking, perceiving. Oh, interesting. Because, it, let me know, because the perceiving types like open options. They don't like to be boxed in. They're, they're not big planners. List, and, you know, you kind of have to be a J in a way to be an organizer, I think. I haven't taken, that's the one that I haven't taken recently. I got really angry, I think, once, and I, like, switched personalities to someone who was, like, very interested in their self-image, and so then I, then I decided that I wasn't going to take it for a little bit and might need to revisit. I'll send you a link. It'll be interesting to see. Um, yeah. So, um, what, what got you started, first of all, with thinking about education and being an activist in that field? Yeah, so I would say I really, I think I moved from Eastern Kentucky and I was very interested in conformity and normality. Um, I had a much thicker accent than I do now. Um, I was, I mean, in I think in a lot of ways I was, I felt like an outsider um, in this like, magnet program in middle school where everyone a lot of people had gone to school together in elementary school um and also like culturally had completely different norms I mean I think I think I thought that the parts of Kentucky that I had interacted with were the parts of Kentucky like were very representational of the state because much the places where I grew up are the places that are Kentucky is stereotyped by right so it's very easy to think that when you aren't interacting with other kids who are not from that region that like everybody is wearing cowboy boots and like, that's such a, it's such a silly example, but like grew up making candy, for example, right? Like I remember talking about kind of the foods that were like really important to my family and people being like, what is that? Like we've never had soup beans. We've never had these things that like felt like 
um, felt really important to my childhood. So I was in that position and I, I felt really the need to prove myself. And I also think that I very quickly, um, was able to be surrounded by people. Um, at the time I was really, really interested in like school and my own education and had always been, um, kind of like selected in school, which now retrospectively is not ideal for the rest of the kids in the school, but it was how my education had gone thus far. And so I think like all of these different factors came together in me through the Jewish community, hearing about this student voice um, activism group, which had just started like two years earlier and had some really cool big legislative wins um, and was like really working to integrate students into their own education. And I had a lot of time on my hands and was really a go-getter and was also like kind of corporate and interested in resume building and interested in finding out what, you know, like what it meant to get into an Ivy League or something like that. Um, and then this guy who I totally idolized joined. So then I joined. <laughs> uh, and that was in middle school? Yes. So I started with Student Voice when I was in seventh grade. And I really, really quickly um, kind of moved away from, I think, the original, the rationale behind my joining. Um, I remember the first roundtable I ever conducted was at Kentucky School for the Deaf. Um, and it was a really poignant, I was one-on-one. -on -one, so I did a roundtable and then I did, the, did a one-on-one -on -one with this kid through an interpreter. Um, and it like, was significantly older than me, but had so much shared experience despite our radically different backgrounds. And it really, I very quickly became interested um, and invested in changing people's education for the better. Um, and I also think I like believed in this idea that a lot of our societal problems could be fixed through education, um, which I think then I started to move away from, which is why I'm doing the work I am now. Um, but yeah, so I did that. I started in seventh grade. I did that until I actually just, I still do it a little bit, but I just stepped down from being the executive director um, and now have passed it on to someone else who I was sharing it with a little bit. Um, and now I focus on Sunrise. So I found Sunrise through, um, I guess, still a little bit of this mindset of like looking for other youth activist groups that were doing really interesting work that I could plug into. Um, I, I think not realizing, not realizing how much greater like the impact could be um, because a lot of what I had done had been very confined to like changing one person's life or empowering one person. Um, and also like hadn't been real structurally change focused. So I was scrolling through Twitter. I was really, really reju like energized by the 2018 midterms. Um, I was like moving towards kind of this more progressive ideology. Um, and then I saw Sunrise up and I hopped on this mass call, which at the time was like 200 people. Um, and that's what our mass calls consisted of. And <laughs> Somebody found me um, who has been my mentor for about a year and I work still work really closely with her um, and she we did breakout groups and I didn't say anything until I was forced to introduce myself and I said hi I'm Lily I'm 15 years old and I'm from Kentucky and I really quickly got this text like we have very few people from Kentucky and almost no high schoolers and like really started to do the work got it um what what have you seen in terms of Bar Vinarshi? How do you say her name? Who co-founded? Prakash. Yes. Yeah. What 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 do you think she brought to the table that made Sunrise bloom so quickly and be so effective? Yeah. So I think that a couple. I think Sunrise has been super effective for a couple of reasons. One. I think. I mean. I personally am really deeply committed to our theory of change. And I think that came from years of movement building study at places like Momentum um, and really intentionally crafting a movement that was like, we say we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So like really intentionally looking at the civil rights movement, anti-war movement, um, and then smaller movements like Occupy and why that was not as successful as it could have been. All right, so I think like, 
first and foremost, the attention to historical learning um, and structure building is is one of the reasons we've been so successful. But I also think that um, we're led by somebody who's incredibly charismatic, who articulates our points in ways that, um, I mean, I hope to be able to. You know, Sunrise is really built upon stories. Everybody, that's how I became a part of the movement. I shared my story at one of our really big actions. Um, and I think that that's the case for a lot of people. Um, even if they aren't sharing their stories, they're having these conversations with individuals. Um, and I and I think Varsh is able to connect with everyone and in their individual stories in ways that I really have not seen of a lot of people. Um, she did a rally in Chico, where I live, and I videoed little clips of it that are on my YouTube channel. So I got to see her in oh. action. And, and she was definitely charismatic and and very energizing for the for the crowd for sure you know we had the same so the green new deal tour that we did like across the united states also came to frankfurt kentucky um which was super cool um and i think we partnered with some really interesting local organizers here um but i think it was really cool for folks here to see to see people like varsh on stage and to see people of color who i think are often forgot about, forgotten about in our state's politics on stage and leading the fight. Um, yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how old were you roughly when you got acquainted with Sunrise? So it was December of 2018, really, or November of 2018. So I was, I was 15 at the time, yes, 15. And, um, so I, I got on this call and I very quickly um, was connected with Aaron Bridges, who is one of our founders um, and is actually based out of Louisville, Kentucky. Oh. And, and I very, within two weeks, was on a bus going to a Nancy Pelosi sit-in. Um, so that, it, I rapidly became involved in like this very extreme way that I also think is now no longer the norm for a lot of folks because we're so, so decentralized. Um, but I was lucky enough to be there for one of our, like really a watershed moment, both in our public um, growth. Like we began to grow exponentially after both that and the Mitch McConnell action and the Nancy Pelosi action before. Um, but also, yeah, I think there's nothing like a huge sunrise action and to to begin that way. Oh, I think. yeah. It's exciting, for sure. Yes. Um, is there a hub in Lexington? Yeah. So um, we are really, like, I think revitalizing is the right term, the hub in Lexington right now. Um, we have a hub in Louisville, Kentucky, and we also have a really, really strong hub in western Kentucky in Bowling Green. Um, so, And then we're going to have strike circles across the state, um, Strike Circles are a program that we did leading up to December 6th and a program we're going to continue leading up to Earth Day, which allow people to kind of create communities of organizers in their school or workplace or institution um, and almost like create mini hubs so that they're able to take action um, in ways that are accessible to them and organize where they're at. So do you meet face to face or how, did, how is the like the day to day organizing done in your hub? Absolutely. Um, we do meet face. We we have in person meetings um, once a month, and then I spend a lot of time on the phone or on Skype or on Zoom, primarily Zoom. Um, and I work a little bit nationally, actually a lot nationally for Sunrise as well as locally. Um, and I before really we got a hub here super strong. I did a lot of high school climate organizing in Louisville. Um, because that's one of the most polluted areas of Kentucky and home to some of, like, the worst environmental racism. And so I planned September 20th and, like, some previous strikes with a cohort of folks there. So that was very much so, you know, four hours a day on my – on Zoom. Oh, boy. And, and then – there's a lot of um, reluctance to have hierarchies. There, there has been since the second wave of the women's movement that media stars are suspect and, and you know, having a hierarchy. But, in fact, 
there's a famous article um, by Joe Freeman who points out they exist and it's better to acknowledge them and and um, talk about that there are going to be differentials in, in tasks and power and abilities and talents. So how do you how do you organize leadership in the hub? Yeah, um, in the hub that's still certainly developing. Um, we kind of have a core group of individuals right now and are figuring out steps moving forward. In the past, um, I think leadership in a place like Kentucky looks very different than in other places because mm -hmm. I, I think we're mobilizing a smaller group of people. Um, just to be frank about it, like the people who before September 20th were willing to do any climate action was a much smaller pool, I think. And so I ended up organizing our September 20th strike with primarily two other people. And so the question of leadership, um, the question of leadership was not, I think, as pronounced as it is in a lot of other places where coalition dynamics are very strong um, or even different organizations are working together. Um, because we just had, we didn't have a lot of folks, right? Um, now we have a really incredible high school team that's working at a Kentucky level um, that is going to have like eight people who all applied for positions um, and are taking on different things like outreach and policy and with the intention of it being as flat as possible. Um, no, but I agree. I think that any successful movement has some kind of hierarchy and structure um, ideally, all of the work is happening in a really decentralized way and hubs are autonomous and individual groups are empowered to act and the hierarchy is only there to provide resources and support for individual groups um, to be as successful as possible. Um, but I think, I think that we have been successful because of our structure um, in ways that I, I've seen. I've seen different structures in the climate movement and yeah, I've stuck, I've stuck with Sunrise. Right. So right now, about how many people are active in the Lexington Hub and what percent of those are women or young women? That's a really good question. Um, we're having like a re-kind of orienting meeting next week. So I can have a better sense after that. Um, we've had some people who have transitioned because of college and things like that and want to really ground ourselves again. Um, I would say, I would say the climate space is actually less dominated by women than the education policy space. That is not to say that it is not dominated by women, but it is one of the few social movements on the whole that I've been a part of where I feel like there are men in the room. I mean, to the extent that when I worked with Student Voice, there were I mean, when I was executive director, I think there were no men on our leadership team. Um, and so I would say, actually, interestingly enough, in Lexington, I would almost say it's 50-50, perhaps skewing more men. Um, we have a really strong organizing uh, community, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, um, that has been in the state for many decades and really created strong relationships and communities. And I think that's how a lot of people have become organizers. Um, and we have like a number of grassroots organizations like that. Um, but I find, I do find that people who are like coming to this work are disproportionately women. And why do you think that is? <laughs> I don't know. You know, well, I think that, you know, we're all, I think everyone is coming to this because of some experience in their life or some background. I meet very few people, um, I meet very few people who are spurred only by climate science, who are in the climate movement, right? And, you know, I think, I think women and female identifying persons are empowered in ways right now that I have not seen ever in my lifetime, right? even the fact that we're seeing so many female candidates on stage, whether or not I agree with them, um, the fact that that is even a norm and a possibility and something we can expect um, is really radical and also really empowering for more women to take action, I think. And in that vein, I became really involved with Sunrise following the election of people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and to see really powerful young women mm -hmm. uh, 
is like, I mean, it is a catalyst for, I think, a lot of people, um, and a lot of people who have felt disempowered in one way or another, um, which I think sometimes is women due to any, our social structures. Right. I, I wonder if <clears throat> Trump, we have to give him credit that he spurred a lot of activism and a lot of feminism because he's so vile. So, yeah. You know, I think that I have not done a lot of research into whether like things like the Women's March were real catalysts for folks who I organize with. Um, I think that I think that Parkland is something that I would say I cite as like a turning point in high school organizing, um, especially for white high schoolers who I think had, um, who I think unfortunately did co-opt the gun violence movement, but had never felt uncomfortable or a lot of people had never felt uncomfortable in their schools or in their lives or in their, just their everyday settings in the way um, that I think black and brown bodies feel. And I think that really catalyzed, um, I would say that that it has been the biggest catalyst of my generation. Yeah. Parkland, they were, they were so brilliant in terms of their media outreach and getting the word out. It seems to me their focus now is on getting people registered, young people registered to vote. That's and, my understanding as well. And passing legislation in mm -hmm. Congress and in the states. Um, yeah. And they were, they were probably more men in, in the leadership in the Parkland students. So that was interesting. Well, I think it's interesting how even when there are women who are dominating the movement, men seem to rise sometimes to leadership. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I talked to Hannah and Georgia, and she, she pointed out that there's a coolness factor, that for high school boys, they don't see activism as cool. I think that changes in the 20s, but what, what do you, what's your reaction to that? I don't think anyone sees, I mean, in, where I'm organizing, I don't know how many people are seeing activism as cool. Oh, um, I think it's so cool. I can't imagine anyone not thinking it is. <laughs> I do, right? Like, who wants to shut down school for Earth Day with me? Like, I'm I'm all for it, but I, I think that there is a huge social stigma attached to being a high school activist wow. um, in a lot of places. Right? Like, I think that the idea, I mean, I think, like, first off, the idea of putting yourself out there in that way and, and to be vulnerable in those spaces um, to actually care about something is something that most high schoolers are unwilling to do. Um, and I don't, I don't think my generation is apathetic, right? Like, I think that's something I read in the New York Times a lot that really pisses me off, right? Because we do care and we're angry. But, but whether or not people are spurred to action because of that um, is a whole nother story. And then people who aren't angry, it's like, you know, I think, I think a lot of people are comfortable and they're not willing to risk their comfort to fight for someone else's discomfort or like to alleviate it. So hmm. interesting. Um, so when, when you coordinate the hubs with the national people in, in New York, how, how do you do conference calls? Do you do conferences? How do you coordinate as all yeah. the hubs. They're like 231 or something like that. Yeah. Um, so there are ways that hub leaders connect through Slack um, and through other things. A lot of hubs are very decentralized and are doing work um, and coordinating through resources and like doing things like launch parties, but um, might not even be talking to hub leaders on the daily, like other hub leaders on the daily. Um, I know a lot of my national work comes from, I work on what's called our future voters team. So there are six of us who are really committed to developing middle and high school programming moving forward until Earth Day, um, four people full time to do this. And then myself and one other high school people, individual who are still like in school. Um, so a lot of my coordination is coming from writing that curriculum and working with those folks and like understanding what the challenges are for them and 
caucusing and really just like having those conversations and then bringing them back to a place like Lexington and to my school. Um, so I'd say there are like mechanisms for people to talk to each other, but I also think a lot of things evolve really organically and people meet at trainings and they stay connected for one reason or another. Um, and they have friends in the movement. So it's, I think it's a mix of both organic and structured conversation. Um, you mentioned the daily, is that like an email group? information sharing what what's the daily oh no I just meant like frequently I oh. think it, yeah. is, so people are what I'm what I'm looking for is there some central like Instagram account or oh absolutely we communicate entirely through um movement wide communication is happening through slack um which most hub leaders are in not all hub members are in it absolutely not but most hub leaders, actually, I would venture to say all hub leaders are a part of Slack. Um, but other than that, people are working really autonomously. Mm -hmm. And have you been to trainings? Yes. And um, what? I've done nonviolent direct action training, um, public narrative training, and then I've led uh, recently on Martin Luther King Day weekend. Um, a team and I led 50 middle and high schoolers in basic organizing and escalation training um, in preparation for Earth Day. And I'm helping to put on kind of a 200 person middle and high school summit on President's Day weekend. So, a, a summit okay. about climate activism? Yes, for high schoolers to escalate. And middle and high schoolers. What, what would you say are the key points that you make when you do those trainings in terms of? Um, organizing and escalating what what are the points you want to really get home so I think there are a couple of things I think fundamentally um, high schoolers have a really or students like middle and high when I say high schoolers I'm referring to both but it's just more convenient um, I think we have a really skewed perception of authority right and this idea that to create change, we're gonna do so within the confines of our school and with the permission of our administrators and with the permission of, um, I think parents is sometimes going too far. I'm lucky to have supportive ones, but understands that that is not the case for other folks and that is really an inhibiting factor. But I think school is a really good example. So I think the first thing that I think is so necessary is to unpack this idea of asking for permission um, and having that be the driving force of change. Because ultimately, the Children's March did not ask for permission, right? And I think that any, any big watershed moment um, or turning point has not happened from people asking permission. Um, but I, I really think people, I think that students are, rightfully so, really, really afraid of what it means to take radical action in the United States of America today. I mean, we do not have the protest culture of other countries. We do not even have the protest culture, I think, that we once did. Um, we're stuck in like this Reagan alignment. Um, so usually I don't go into jargon, but I really try to unpack that. Um, and then I think moving from there, it's, it's a mix of hard skills and really hard conversations, right? So like, you're never going to have a successful movement unless you can facilitate a meeting or have a one-on-one -on -one with someone or invite them to join your strike or know how to do recruitment well, um, right? Like these are like skills that people really just need to be, to sit down and to practice and to go through activities and to action plan and to get feedback, right? So I think all of those things, um, like I want to, I I think I always want somebody to walk away with like having concrete knowledge that they feel like they're going to go back into their communities and immediately begin to implement. Um, but I also think having really hard conversations is equally, if not more important, right? Like talking about the intersection of race and gender identity and socioeconomic background and what that means for the climate movement, talking about, you know, power, um, authority, where you're getting permission, um, I think like having those conversations in my experience has stuck with me and made and informed my organizing in ways that hard skills could not have, but I think would not have been effective if I didn't have those hard skills. So a hard skill is like writing a press release or 
planning an agenda for a meeting or something like that. Absolutely. And when, what do you think are the keys to recruiting? Because you said that for most people, they don't come to the movement because of the facts about science of climate change. They have some kind of personal experience. Like what, what was a personal experience for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Eastern Kentucky, which is King Cole. Um, as a lot of people, I think a lot of people, that's what they associate with it. Um, and you know, in short, I don't think for much of my life, I think I was observing, um, cyclical poverty and also like real exploitation from outside industries of an entire region. Mm. Um, which culminated in the end in like the opioid crisis that we're facing right now with unemployment rates that are sky high. Um, and just with like a, I think a general feeling of, um, I think a loss of hope, um, in a lot of ways that Eastern Kentucky will ever become maybe what it, it once felt like or thrive really. Um, so I think like, there are a lot of really small experiences that solidified that, but even just driving past like numerous trailer parks, over 50% of the population of my county is living in a trailer, right? Yeah, at one time we were the poorest county in the state and numbers don't mean everything, but they also give a really good sense of living like that as the norm and coming to accept that and also recognizing that even as someone who like qualified for Medicare when I was younger, like was considered economically really 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 pretty privileged for the region um and also like having immense social capital living there right like it's it's odd I think sorry that's my dog in the background he's waiting for me. <laughs> um yeah but you know I think that like being surrounded by all of those different things but also understanding like my parents are both community organizers um at one point in their lives, my mom did a lot of work with like mental health and is a social worker, right? So like hearing just, I think just like the culmination of hearing about all of these things, but not necessarily knowing that that had an intrinsic effect um, or like was linked to climate change, right? So many iotas later, um, uh, understanding that fighting climate change also meant fighting a lot of the things that I was seeing in the community where I grew up and it meant to just transition and that a green new deal, um, not that the exploitation that was causing cyclical poverty was the exploitation that was causing, you know, climate change on the whole. Um, I think the link was really solidified for me. Um, yeah. So like in short, I think that's what brought me to sunrise. And when I recruit people, you know, I think there are a couple of things. Um, I was so proud. Um, we had two people who came to our training from rural Louisiana where they get Confederate flags waved in their faces um, when they do any kind of action. And I mean, that is not the case for Lexington, Kentucky, thankfully, right? Like I'm not, I'm not that far into the deep South or the red States. Um, but they just hosted a launch party and had like 20 people come from their school. And that's, I think a win, right? Like I think when you're recruiting people, you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations, not with your friends, right? Because if your friends were interested, they would already be joining you, right? They're, they're watching me do my work. If they wanted to be a part of it, there was a way in. But I think having conversations with people who you never would think you would be talking to, but who are going to be really disproportionately impacted by climate change or care um, for one reason or another, you know, I'm in the process of doing outreach to members or to different communities at my school and different kind of populations and cliques. And I think that if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have been going to environmental club and young Democrats and more social justice focused clubs like UNICEF club. But I think that right now I've, those people are committed to what they're doing, right? Like organizing organizers, gets you nowhere <laughs> I cried, and they did not they didn't show up in the ways I needed them to right like they didn't they didn't have the time to give and it, if this was something they were interested in they probably would have found it you know what I mean because because that's who they were um 
so now, you know, I'm like, I, I think I'm doing what think people would think was really embarrassing, like tabling at my school and flyering and going to do a mass drop of like, this is come to this meeting. We're doing things for Earth Day and like recruitment in ways that I think feels really scary and isolating and very socially stigmatizing. Um, but it's actually how you find people, right? Because if you get a core team of like 15 people, then you're golden. Yeah. So most of the recruitment comes from face-to-face rather than social media? Yeah, I get some people over social media. Um, but, you know, you mentioned earlier, like, climate celebrities um, and kind of, like, faces of the movement. And I think I think those folks are really, really important in bringing people in over social media um, and engaging with people um, across the country. But I also, I think that that's not my role. And I think... That I haven't made that my role and so uh, I mean there are a few people who are like admiring my work through my social media but the vast majority of people I'm talking to and they're people I actually interact with mm-hmm. um, why do you think that your generation has done Parkland and Me Too and Women's March and Climate Change I, it seems to me particularly activists and starting at really young ages like at 10 and 11 people like Lily in Netherlands are organizing what 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 do you think enables that youth leaderships at so early so young yeah you know I think I think for me it was I think it was like a lot of anger right climate change is disproportionately impacting my generation and no one before has done anything of great of that that is necessary to stop it. Yeah. Right. I think that when you look at the timeline for climate change and you realize, you know, twelve years from when the IPCC report was published, I'm gonna be twenty eight. So what's the point of talking about going to law school or med school when I would still be in those schools when really apocalyptic scenarios began to happen and the world around me was like you know, the environment around me was crumbling, or maybe not around me in particular, but the world we lived in was on fire. Yeah. So I think, like, coming to that recognition, um, I think a lot of my generation is there or slowly getting there. Um, But I don't know. Again, I think... I would, I would also say, I think anger is probably the strongest motivator for my entire generation. And even if you're not doing climate change work, it's anger that our country moved really, really centrist or to the right following Reagan. And everything that my parents fought for, um, and my parents are older, so, you know, I understand this isn't the case with everyone, but the ideals that I think they thought were secure began to be thwarted. Um, And at a certain point, how much more can you take, right? And maybe the generation before me was really beaten down and didn't feel like they could. Maybe it was the recession. I don't know, right? But like... Generation Y did occupy. So they they did occupy. there There was definitely a start. But I also think that, I mean, social movement, social media has catalyzed connection in a way that, I've never seen, right, if I didn't know that people were striking in New York in throngs, would I be organizing as hard as I am now? Maybe not, right? So I just think that, I think that a combination of, like, an inability to ignore what's happening um, and really an inability to be complacent, um, but also, like, being provided with the tools and the technology to make connections happen, right? Like all of this kind of culminated in my generation being able to, to organize in ways that we've never seen. Yeah. So it's a combination of anger and social media (laughs) to put it in a nutshell. Interesting. You, You mentioned going to Catholic school. You mentioned having some Jewish connections. Had those values shaped your thinking? 
Yeah, um, so I am Jewish, um, which is funny because I did go to Catholic school, but it was the one private school in Eastern Kentucky, and <laughs> my mother wanted me to get a central or a personalized education. So every we say every Catholic school needs a good loudmouth Jewish Jewish girl and her mother. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's a really interesting question because. I don't think I was raised, I was raised very secular. My father is an ardent atheist. Um, And so I think that some of the values I grew up learning from my mother and her family, like the value of education and the value of just like the idea of giving and the idea of giving back to the world and taking care of the environment around you. And I think these very basic core parts of my identity that I watched my my family model for me are in many ways like ideas of Sadaka and ideas of Judaism. Um, but I don't know if they were ever shown to me as such. Um, it's so funny that you asked this because actually, um, next week on Tuesday, I'm, we're having like really our first Jewish event to, um, talking about the climate crisis. It's called coexisting for climate change or for climate justice. Um, the temple is putting it on, but it's like an interfaith, um, focused event on combating climate change. So I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, it's interesting to me because I mentioned I did the trilogy about visionary scientists, and I'd say a third of them come from Reformed Jewish backgrounds, much more than you would expect by the number of, of Jews in the U.S. and England and where these people are from. And they said that they, they do think that Judaism emphasizes social responsibility and also working in the cracks not not being far to, part of the dominant culture gives you a, a different worldview yeah no i definitely think there's something i think there's something valid to that i think that jewish teachings prioritize a lot of the same things that i am fighting oh you did not mean to do that um, but prioritize a lot of the same things i am fighting for. Um, I also have found that there are like a disproportionate number of Jews in these spaces. Um, but I also, I think it's, I think it's something that, you know, for a number of reasons, modern American Jews are grappling with their Jewish identity more than ever, especially as the idea of Israel is becoming increasingly politicized. Um, right. And like an entire, and you know, I think like as a religion, um, like when you, I think when you're one state it becomes kind of like immensely political, right? Like I think progressive Jews are grappling with their identities and really conservative Jews are grappling with their identities mm-hmm. um, and are forced to do so by the current climate we live in. Yeah, absolutely. So if you had your dream university, what would that be? <sighs> right what? now I'm trying to figure out if there even is a university. Um, uh, you know, you gotta, sometimes I think I might take a year off. My mother is not too happy about this, but, you know, but then she taught, she spoke to somebody who, like, graduated from Northwestern, and which she, you know, views as, like, an acclaimed school, which is fine and everything, um, who said, like, really frankly, you know, you're, what's, what's the point of education if there's gonna be a climate crisis, right? Like, and I still, I, ha, I have great value in education, and I also would really like to be in a place where I'm surrounded by like-minded individuals for maybe the first time in my life, um, and feel like I'm being really intellectually challenged and stimulated, but also, like, where I'm on a campus where I'm not fighting to talk about things like colonization, um, or, like, racism, or white supremacy, or, like, have these conversations. Um, so... David, you know, David Hogue, the, you know, the Parkland student, he took yeah. a gap year and then went to Harvard. So yeah. one of my, one of my good friends is taking her second year off and she's, um, yeah, she's committed, um, to another like elite institution and they, they only let you take a second year off if it's for religious service or for military service. So she said that working to fight climate change was, she got a rabbi to sign off on it as okay. being a religious service. But if, if you, let's say you took a gap year, where, what seems appealing to you in terms of universities? Um, 
I, you know, I'm looking at places that are, like, pretty progressive, pretty, like, have a commitment to being going carbon neutral. My mother went to Brown. My father went to tiny school in Kentucky. Um, so, you know, I, my family's, some of my family's from New England. I think they'd love it if I went back. Um, but I think, like, really a commitment. Um, I think that I do not want to feel like I'm selling out on my values by attending a university um, that is going to push me through and expect me to go to Goldman Sachs. Um, <laughs> you know. What, what, that's true right what, now. what seems like an intriguing major? So this is so funny that you ask. Um, until, probably until I worked with Sunrise, I thought I was going to be a museum, a modern art curator. Um, I've done a lot of work with art history and really enjoy it and would still really major in art history um, or like English or sociology or philosophy or a com combination of the three. Um, I joke that I believe in majors that like don't matter in the real world. Um, <laughs> but, like, do you have to think? Um, so something, something in that vein. And then, and then do work professionally in activism or do art history? I thought about this a lot. I think that I have, I think that right now I feel like I, I need to continue doing the kind of work I'm doing until I have some, some faith in its success. Um, so what, however that arises, you know, if that means working for Sunrise full time, that means working for Sunrise full time, but that also is not how movements continue, right? Movements continue by me working a job that allows me to organize, right? Or like that pays for my housing and my food. And then on the side, I'm doing this, this kind of work. So I don't, I don't think I have a clear, I think I have less of, now I have less of a vision of what I'm going to do moving forward than I ever have in my life, mm -hmm. but more of a commitment to one thing and one and solving something. Mm -hmm. does, does environmental science intrigue you or not? You're more a humanities person. Yeah. Um, I did not, I did not join the movement because of any great interest in the climate. You know, I think, I think I care about it because this is where we live. I care that 1 billion species are, on the verge of extinction, right? Like I really, now that I know the science, I care deeply about it and its implications. Um, but I did not become involved because of the science. Um, and science goes <laughs> way ahead. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so as you think about the, the situation, are you, optimistic or are you pessimistic that we'll be able to turn it around yeah so you know people like Naomi Klein and Emily Atkin um I think have said very clearly that the possibility of us turning something around before two degrees of warming it is pretty slim right so realistically we're looking at three to four and I think, but I, I think that one of Sunrise's core principles is um, we stay hopeful, um, we shine bright is really what it's called. But I think that you can't do this work if you're bogged down in pessimism. I think that, at least for me, um, as someone for whom that runs in, in the family and who has had many experiences with mental health in their life, right, like, I have to stay optimistic to continue to, con to do this work. Um, and I also think that when you give up hope and write New York Times op-eds that say things like, you know, like, fuck it, we're going to let the climate warm and let's just have fun until that point. Oh, gosh. Right? Like, and we're going to, what's the point, right? And when, you're, when you begin to ask that question, right, like, that's, that's coming from a place of such great privilege where you're at a point that you can give up and watch other people be impacted before you and think that even if we can't stay below two degrees of warming, that staying below three or four is not 
necessary, right? And where it's the sliding slope of either two, and once you know that you can't hit that, it's nothing, right? Like I, I can't, I can't get behind that, and I, it's not who I am as an individual, and also, not, not the world I want to live in. Right. You know, studies show that there's an increase in anxiety and depression rates among teens, especially young women. And I wonder if you see that in your sphere, that there's more anxiety and depression. Yeah. I think people are talking about it more, which I think is a net positive. Um, right? Like, I think the idea of therapy is no longer taboo. Um, or as much as it was. Um, and I think talking about anxiety and depression is no longer, maybe not two stages of vulnerability, that's still not the norm. But I think like talking about it with close friends or even with acquaintances and having that shared experience and being open about it is something that I find um, is, is more common in my generation. I think, I mean, I don't know what it would be like, I think, to live with a bunch of people or with go to school with a bunch of people who weren't talking about these kinds of things, right? I mean, I think that maybe anxiety and depression is up, but it, it really seems to me that we're just able to articulate it more and that it's been there for a really long time or, or maybe it is. And maybe it's because we're really stressed about the world that we're living in and our future. Um, and there's more pressure on us in terms of school and advanced placement and endless amounts of tests and student loan debt. Um, and all of these barriers to success that have been imposed upon us. Um, yeah, but, but I really, I really can't imagine what it would be like to not have that as the norm. It, it seems to me that there's, because of the women's movement, that there's tremendous pressure that you've got to, you know, do great SATs, get into a great university, have a career, look good, then maybe be a, a mom and a partner and look good all the while. And it, it's just, there's, a, there's more pressures on women than there are in men than young men, I think, to achieve like that. And, and, and they're, around the world, there are more women graduating from university, except in Africa. So they, they are achieving more. I think, I think there is immense... I mean, I think that it is only recently that I've come to realize how my gender has impacted my, my ideals of achievement. Um, because I think if you would ask me, even in middle school, where I had always been the bossy kid my entire life, <laughs> yeah, like I think I would have said it was a personality trait. And maybe it is, but I also think, um, I think to be in a space, I often feel like I have much more to prove, um, right? And like someone like Pete Buttigieg just makes me feel like I have even more to prove um, when you're allowed on a debate stage for having potential um, as opposed to having experience, right? Like that's, I think, the lens that I've started to view it in. I think that men in, in general um, are given opportunity because people see potential in them um, and women women are expected to have exponentially more experience. Um, that being said, I would say like most clearly understand pressures of being a woman um, in the, like in body image, um, and I think that's something that has impacted me for all of my life, um, for as long as I've, like, me, for as long as I've been cognizant of it. I think that that has really been the idea, the ideal of like white feminine beauty, um, has been the clearest, kind of like toxic masculine, uh, or toxic like patriarchal, um, impact. But but I also think like, I don't know like. Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement um, and, and dealing with sexual harassment in my school and understanding what it meant to have to do that and fight um, as a woman in that context with an all-male administration was a really interesting experience and also one that was, you know, I think that, 
I, I know I'm being really long-winded. Oh, it's wonderful. No, but I, I would say, in short, I, I lived for much of my childhood believing that my sense of achievement was entirely a facet of who I was and not necessarily a combination of who I was and my gender. Um, and I think it was only when I was placed outside of my family that was filled with very strong and foul-mouthed women <laughs> um, <laughs> and placed in like a public high school um, that I understood the extent to which it it was both. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, the, what I'm amazed at is young climate change activists, I think probably more girls than boys, have garnered a lot of, um, uh, you know, nasty, mean comments in social media and, you know, people being afraid. And uh, so I'm wondering if you've been the brunt of any of that kind of attack and how you cope. Yeah. Um, well, I'm kind of honored. I mean, honestly, if I'm important enough for somebody to leave hate comments on, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, truly honored. Like, it means that something I said made them angry or uncomfortable or resonated or something. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's so funny. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Young Turks. I had never heard of it. Um, it's kind of like this really liberal, I think it's like a YouTube Maybe it's on cable as well, but, like, it's definitely on YouTube. Yeah, I they're never... newscasters. Like, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of them. I, I had never heard of it until I was on Young Turks. Um, and this was this was the first time I'd ever taken action with Sunrise. Um, it was December of 2018. And I was, like, standing in Representative Hoyner's office, and I was telling my story, and I made it on Young Turks, and I was really, really excited about it. And then somebody, like... All these people started writing these comments because, of course, Young Turks is, like, now I learn, like, breeding grounds for the far right to leave their angry comments. Oh. Just like, because it's, like, you know, it's just one of those, like, more farther left sites. So in the same way that, like, really liberal people go on Fox News and get really enraged and they're, like, this is bullshit and, you know, tweet it. Right? Like, same thing. But, you know, I – this is – to this day, this is one of the funniest things that I've ever, like, read on the internet. And I, I don't even know what it means. But somebody – Somebody typed and they said, like, Lily Gardner, you pencil tucky sodomy slut. And I, I have no idea what that means. Right? Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, I know what all those words mean on their own, except maybe pencil tucky. <laughs> I don't understand how that can be considered <laughs> malicious. <laughs> it's just really ridiculous. <laughs> I've, I've like there have been instances in my in my organizing career that I've received things like that, right? And like people have said, "Oh, these liberals like hang them," right? And I mean that's scary, but that's probably like the greatest, the deepest extent to it. Um, and it, it's never been direct directed um, at my personal social media. Like I I know of I know of people who have like received thousands of direct messages about a facet of their identity that they cannot control, whether that be their Judaism, the fact that they're queer, right? Like any, the fact that they're not white, any one of these. Lily. 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 Lily, can you hear me now? now I can. Hi. Hi. Where did I cut it? Um, you, okay. you were, um, do you think of yourself as a feminist? So, yeah, yeah, um, in the way that I understand feminism. I think that in our history, the feminist movement has not been inclusive of a lot of different folks, right? And I think that there are still feminists out there who view themselves as feminists, but view themselves as very white, privileged feminists for whom, um, and don't include um, all female identifying persons in their activism, right? And I think that I, 
I've recently, only recently, have been reading about ideas like womanism um, and other kind of like conceptions of feminism. Um, and I think that that I think I I would absolutely consider myself a feminist, but but with my understanding of it and not with not a feminist of the early 20th century and not a feminist. Um, yeah, I think, I think that the people who are not feminists often take on that title or who are not truly, um, like participating in like the values and the ideals are accepting that title. Um, and it's really come at the detriment of the movement on the whole. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit different direction. How do you find time for, I'm assuming, AP courses, homework, school, activism, family, temple? How, how do you find time for all that? Do you sleep? So, I do sleep. Um, I'm actually pretty convinced I'm narcoleptic. Um, hmm. I am like a big, big sleeper. I will fall asleep anywhere, which <laughs> maybe is a sign of a lack of sleep, um, but not in my eyes. You know, I'm like... I, I'm out 15 seconds. It's kind of a running joke in, with everyone who knows me. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you know, I I think last year I really hit a very strong burnout in the spring semester of last year um, for a number of different reasons. Um, I had dealt with a lot freshman year and hadn't yet found really organizing or something I was passionate about and was also struggling um, with myself as an individual. Um, and that, I think that really came at the expense of a lot of different elements of my life. And since that, since that point have been fairly committed to, to prioritizing balance in the way that I can. Um, that is not to say I'm not a workaholic. Like I work constantly from when I get home to, you know, like 11 PM. Um, I didn't realize that was not the norm until recently when somebody <laughs> asked me, like, they were like, oh, we go home from school and take a nap. And I was like, wow, I've never taken a nap. Um, you know, so, like, you know, I, I do my organizing, and then if I have time, I do my homework. Um, you know, if I don't have time, then I miss my 22nd day of school or what is going to be something like my 30th this year. Um, it's ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm in a really unique situation right, like where I have a parent who's very supportive, um, whom I live with and who's like willing to cook for me when I can't, don't have time to do that or participate, um, and whose only requirement is that I play classical piano. Um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I think that, I think balance took a really long time and I wouldn't say I like achieved it, but I also like understand the limitations of my ability to work and also function as a human being. Um, and Honestly, having huge mental health episodes takes a lot more time away from what I'm trying to do than like committing to sleeping for seven hours a night and working out and playing piano and, you know, like taking half an hour to make myself dinner, right? Like these are things and studying, right? Which I think a lot of organizers might not have time to do, right? Like these are things that I learned the hard way. I think I had to. I had to do some of. What What do you mean by huge mental health episodes? Yeah. Um, so I like have struggled with um, depression like throughout my um, kind of like my high school career. Um, I realized I had seasonal affect really late in the game last year, and I then got a light and had kind of a life changing experience of what is what it means to have sunlight year round. Um, yeah, but I think. I think for a you know, I, I was not in a really good school situation. Um, I was feeling very lonely in Kentucky. And then I, I also had this kind of more biological sense of depression um, or cause of depression. And then um, also some real climate anxiety. So, you know, I think that I, th I, I don't think it dictates a lot of my activism in the way that I think other people I've met mental me mental health experiences have brought them to like the position that they are here and now I think like um it's I think 
it's a part of my life that has shaped who I am as an individual, but maybe not who I am as an organizer. Um, but certainly something that uh, I've had to had to deal with. Now, the I was interested that the person I interviewed in in Stockholm said that a lot of the people, at least in Sweden, were on the autism spectrum. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. I I cannot speak to that at all, but that's also really incredible and also so important to create a movement that's exclusive of all neurological capabilities and, yeah, something I'm trying to work on. Um, just say a word about the Green New Deal. Do you Are you hopeful that it will be implemented? Who do you think is the best candidate who would be uh, who would put it into practice yeah this is yeah so you know I think the Green New Deal represents to me um possibility um and like radical reform to our society in so many different areas so this means environmental conservation but it also means right like a just transition which is huge economic reform um in a place like eastern Kentucky um, and job training, and even a federal jobs guarantee, and Medicare for all, and a lot of these really progressive, I think, stances, um, that at the end of the day, I think people try and parse out and say, oh, but you can have climate justice without supporting all of these other kinds of justice, and at the end of the day, right, like, it's not going to work, right, like, and we're also never going to and when it, when it doesn't work, then people are going to say that progressivism doesn't work or that really radical solutions don't work. And then they're not going to try them for another 20 years and we're going to have Ronald Reagan. Right. Like I, th the Green New Deal is like the culmination of what frontline communities have been fighting for for decades. And in the case of indigenous communities for generations mm -hmm. and centuries um, since colonization and is at this point common sense. <laughs> um, and that being said, I I am a Bernie stan. I was an Elizabeth Warren stan. I evolved away from that, and I I think that you know I think that having a woman president does not mean as much to me as I thought it once did, um, because I think I've been surrounded by a lot of other really empowering women, and I've seen them in Congress, and maybe. I'm not so attached to this one idea. Um, yeah, but I, I do love Bernie. I campaigned for him in 2016. And I am campaigning for him right now. And Sunrise officially endorsed him. Yeah, I saw that. Well, I, I saw the polls are he's a, ahead in Iowa. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, I I think that at the very least, um, I'm reading like, I'm, I'm trying to really parse out some of the Bernie, like the Sanders, Warren, kind of like I'm Ezra Klein, who I have great respect for, also is really a big Warren supporter. Um, so I've been reading like the case for Warren and like why we need Bernie right now. And um, there's this really interesting part, piece, part of why we need Bernie right now that talked about how you need someone with that charisma who is committed to building a movement um, in this like current time in our political, like, like our, this political moment. Right. Like had if we were not up against Donald Trump, maybe the stakes would be different. Mm -hmm. And maybe if there were not so many candidates in the field, I would happily be supporting someone else. But because of the culmination and the moment that we're in, right, like it's so important that we have one individual who embodies both the values and is able to galvanize people in this way. So I think I'm excited. most of us, if he's not Trump, we'd be happy if he or she is not Trump. That would be a great step forward. <laughs> yes, yeah. so all the all the Democratic candidates are committed to a climate change plan. Yeah, um, the extent is like very different. Mm -hmm. I'm not right, like I'm not an advocate of something like a carbon tax. I think that can be a component, but when people are advocating that as like a very primary solution, or perhaps saying the Green New Deal is a vision and that a carbon tax is a present, you know, or like language that is talking about incrementalism. Um, I think over the past year, I've really come to the belief that that is not how we're going to face the greatest threat to my generation. Um, and that a candidate who isn't committed to that, like, isn't really committed to protecting 
our entire collective interest. Um, so I don't know. It's it's really tough. Um, is there anything else that we've left out that you would like to add in terms of how to make climate activism more widespread and turn this around and what your generation is contributing? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I feel like I've talked for ages, so I, I do not know if I'm leaving anything out for you, um, but I think my advice to a lot of people is that an individual can make a huge difference in a movement. Um, and I think that thinking that climate change is something too big um, to take on, um, or conversely thinking that your plastic straws are the way we're going to save it, or your reusable straws are the way we're going to avert it, either one of those things um, I think is not, it's not how we win, right? And I, I'm committed to bringing as many people into this movement as possible um, and making them feel safe and comfortable and welcome and really empowered and also like they're making huge, huge change. Um, and I don't think that excludes anyone. What, what, what do you personally do? Recycle, buy, use clothes? What, what's your personal contribution? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I have, I use reusable containers and I have, a, I have a metal straw and I have, wooden utensils you know I try not to I try not to produce waste um I'm reading a I th I'm reading inconspicuous consumption by I'm blanking on her last name Tatiana Schlossenberg I think which is a really interesting look at um the individual impact of climate change or the the impact of like individual actions um which I'm not I'm really never an advocate for is the yeah. primary solution um, but I also think it's like something important and something we can be cognizant of, especially when telling my friends or myself to recycle is not like a way to shame them for their economic position. It's just like you're producing a lot of plastic and, you know, less consumption would be ideal, but do what is within really accessible and easy to you, like at the very least, um, but I would say, like, ironically, you know, I am a compost queen. I've been a compost queen since the age of zero when I lived on a cattle farm and we had a really <laughs> thriving compost. Um, I buy vintage clothing, but I think it's because I like how it looks more. Um, right, like, you know, I offset my flights, but do I still fly? Yeah. So, you know, my mom jokes that she bought me a Prius because I – like because she needs me to drive as a single parent in a suburban uh, in the middle of suburbia, but she, I mean it's the all she jokes that it's the only car I could drive, but you know at a certain point I'm still driving. Yeah, there. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, Lily, thank you. Very focused on climate, um, which is really an integral part of their values. Um, so I have a lot of deep respect for them. They evolved out of Standing Rock. Um, so they're, they're phenomenal. Um, yeah, but I would say I also like ultimately at the end of the day have so much respect for, um, I'm good friends with the two women who led the September 20th Boston climate strike who were not even affiliated with an organization at the time, um, when they did it. So I think, um, local leaders in New York and Boston and the Bay Area has phenomenal local leaders. Youth versus Apocalypse um, is one of the few kind of like city-based climate organizations um, that is doing really interesting work. Um, Minnesota, there are organizations like I Matter. Sorry, I'm just like listing them. Um, but I Matter Youth has done really interesting grassroots work there and. Um, done some work with adults and legislators and really started some of the Green New Deal in Minnesota movement. Yeah. So I, I think I admire individuals and organizations, um, but perhaps local groups the most. Interesting. Aha. All right. To be continued. Thank yes. you so much. And um, I'm going to post it on, on YouTube.